Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Telecom video, we're going to be discussing the GTX 1050 Ti, specifically some benchmarks which have appeared on the internet, which give us insight into the card's performance with both Fire Strike and Time Spy. And then we're going to be closing things out with AMD's Zen CPU, because we have some insight thanks to the company releasing some information on Zen's security features, which are very impressive to say the least, particularly for folks processing a lot of virtual machine data or secure um, information from clients, but we'll get into that in just a second. So, first things first, the GTX 1050 Ti. It is naturally based on the Pascal architecture, and we've gone over it a couple of times before, so I'm going to give you a too long didn't read in this video to not cover old ground. Memory size is, of course, 4 gigabytes. That's with 112 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, thanks to a 128-bit memory bus. And finally, um, the clock speed of 1752 with 768 unified cores, in other words, CUDA cores. You're looking at a card which, on paper, puts out roughly the performance of the GTX 960. Well, on paper and reality are two different things. So what about reality? Well, as I mentioned, there are some leaked benchmarks which have appeared on the internet thanks to Chip Hell. Firestrike Ultra the card is putting out 1,853 graphics point where, where graphics points, excuse me, whereas Time Spy you're looking at 2,370. So what does that mean in reality? Well, previously leaked benchmarks had put the GTX 1050 Ti slightly above the GTX 960, whereas these benchmarks put it slightly lower than the GTX 960. But there are a couple of um, asterisks. The first and perhaps the most important of these is that this card is one which actually contains a six pin power connector which is optional. Now what does that mean in reality? Well we don't know exactly but what we can ascertain of course is that the six pin power connector if it is plugged in will no doubt provide extra juice to the core and memory clocks which no doubt are going to contribute to a higher performance level with this particular GPU. So in reality, if you are someone who doesn't buy the 6-pin variant of the card, it's possible we could see lower graphics points. But naturally, we don't know what driver revision um, updates are going to do in terms of the performance of the GPU. So it's possible that we could also see a slight increase towards the end of the cards, uh, well, when the card is finally released on store shelves. To give you an indication, the clock speed, according to GPU-Z, of this particular sample is going all the way up to 1780 megahertz, which is massively above the boost clock of the default GTX 1050 Ti, which operates at just 1468. So once again, you're looking at about 300 megahertz boost, which is, is not insubstantial, is it? Let's just be honest. Now, I want to close things out with Zen. So I'm pretty sure most of you know what Zen is at this point, and just for those who, of you who don't, it is an x86 processor, the next generation CPU from AMD. Now this CPU is being designed from the ground up to be scalable, but high performance, but also suck up a lot less juice than the current excavator and other architectures from AMD. And naturally this means that this processor is going to be a good fit for multiple different uses. The first would be the traditional desktop, also low power solutions, for example, two-in-ones and laptops, but, and this is the primary purpose of the particular feature set we're going to discuss in a second, the enterprise market. By the way, this is also available as an article which is linked in the video description. So the enterprise market is something that AMD have had their beady little eyes on since AMD have lost some market share and that's putting it quite kindly to Intel over the past several years. So there are multiple reasons that a cloud computing company would go with a particular range of processors. One, for example, would be performance, which is obviously pretty important. But the other one is security and AMD are hoping to put this unique feature set 
as a one-up above Intel. So what are these two unique feature sets? Well, the first is SME, known as Secure Memory Encryption, and the second is SEV, which is Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Now, as I said, these two solutions are currently unique to AMD, and even Intel are not supporting them with KB Lake range of processors. So what are they, and how does it work? Well, it's pretty simple, but it's actually very ingenious. So AMD have introduced and integrated a second processor inside Zen as a system on chip, and it is a 32-bit microcontroller. It's an, based on an ARM Cortex A5. Now, this secure processor, as AMD call it, is a system-wide approach to security. In essence, it allows tasks to run in two distinct worlds. The first is secure, and the, and the second is standard operation. So essentially, sensitive data can be cordoned off and sent to secure a world while regular stuff does not have to go through this. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, why is that? What is the purpose? Well, most folks are going to be familiar with hard drive-based encryption. You've probably seen it a thousand times over in movies where some you know, bad guy has encrypted the hard drive and you need to break into it, right? Pretty simple. And you might use various different types of encryption, for example, AES or what have you, to encrypt your drive. Theoretically, it means that the data inside that hard drive is unreadable. Or at least a volume of that hard drive is unreadable unless you crack it or you have the security password. I have done a brief video on uh, encryption on this channel, so you can check it out if you want. But DRAM, in other words, main system memory, is not like that. Basically, data is stored in essentially plain text. That means that you can read it easily. Now, the reason this is really important is because it means that if you have a rogue administrator or some other way to read memory, you could start to, in a simplified way, you could start stealing or leaking data or injecting dubious processors into data and stealing user data from another instance and this is particularly true in virtual machines. So AMD are looking to fix this with, as I just mentioned, these two technologies. So SME, um, and I'm going to read out AMD's own description, main memory encryption is performed via dedicated hardware in the on-die memory controllers. Each controller includes a high-performance advanced encryption standard AES engine that encrypts data when it is written to RAM and then decrypts it when a read is shown. This encryption of data is done with a 128-bit key. In essence, it means that data cannot just simply be grabbed and taken from memory. And when combined with the next thing, which we're going to discuss in just a second, it should be very interesting indeed for certain types of user. So AMD have also included Zen Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Virtualization, just so everyone is on the same page, is virtual machine. If you're not familiar with work virtual machine, I have also done a whole thing on virtual machines as well on this channel, so you can check that out if you want. Too long, didn't read. It means that a hypervisor, or a, I guess you could say a supervisor, runs and basically controls multiple other instances of a machine on your system. In essence, it means that let's say you could have a server which hosts multiple virtual machines, which means that you can have different customers and they can scale those instances as they need them. This is very important now that we're starting to deal with cloud server technology. A lot of it is based upon virtual machines. Well, what happens here? When enabled, says AMD, SEV hardware tags all code and data with a VMASID. Which, which indicates which virtual machine the data is originated from or intended it for. This tag is kept with the data at all times when inside the SOC and prevents the data from being used by anyone else other than the owner. While the tag prevents VM data inside the SOC, AES with 128-bit encryption protects data outside the SOC. Okay, so what the fuck does that mean? I hate the screen. Well, in a nutshell, it means that each virtual machine has its own tag. So in essence, you can just think of it as Bob and John and you know Tracy. In other words, this virtual machine we're gonna call Bob, 
Tracy has her own tag, and so on and so on. It means that Bob cannot read data from Tracy, and Tracy cannot read or write data from John, and it essentially means that because that data is then being written to RAM, which in itself is encrypted as it's read, read and written, theoretically speaking, it not only means that, let's say that you have a customer that has malicious intent, in other words, they wish to steal data from other customers which are on the same server, they cannot do that. Furthermore, if you are a rogue administrator, so for example, you are an employee which is either upset and wants to you know, steal loads of data, or let's say somehow that employee's password or data are compromised, and therefore they gain access to the machine, they cannot then start stealing data, at least theoretically, uh, while the data is in transit. Now, security and virtual machines and encryption are a massive topic in and of themselves. And to be honest with you, I'm not super duper, super duper familiar with them because they are a, you know, a field in and of themselves. But I can tell you one thing, there are going to be a lot of folks in security, encryption and um, server maintenance who are probably very excited by this stuff. Now, how well it works, what performance hit there is, if there are any, and so on and so on and so on remains to be seen. But I can definitely, definitely, definitely see a lot of companies being extremely interested in this stuff for certain usage scenarios, for example, large databases of customer data. And this is particularly true when you start thinking of how many leaks there are, how many users have had their credit cards stolen. And you could start to see how technology like this, because from what I'm reading from the, um, from the slides, there's not that much a user has to do. So in other words, it's all intrinsic, it's built into the hardware. So it's not like you as a VM runner, if that made any sense, in other words, an administrator of a virtual machine, you don't need to really do anything. So let's say you, you provision a server, you don't need to do anything in the back end of your server, it's essentially automated, which means that you don't need to worry so much about this feature. It's not like a feature that is going to require an awful lot of rolling out. And that's actually really important because it theoretically means that it's going to be easy to get off from the ground. Ultimately, I wouldn't be surprised if Intel come up with a similar solution, but for certain usage scenarios, assuming the performance of Zen, and we've gone through this multiple times before about AMD's benchmarks and so on, so I don't want to make a whole video on that topic again but um, at least until there's new information but I wouldn't be surprised if a certain demographic of users find this technology very interesting and certainly a very compelling reason to jump on the Zen bandwagon for servers anyway with all that all said hopefully you've enjoyed the video I'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now